Rachel he almost spelled my, pronounced my last name right, which is pretty impressive. Ah. Very rarely do people do that. Um, I am an evangelist here at um, DataStax, and uh, welcome to our abode. I hope everybody's had their fill of pizza. There's beer somewhere too, right? No. Oh, beer? <laughs> How are you going to sit through this without beer? <laughs>
with every searching is so important and so part of our everyday lives now. I think we take it for granted. And I think for a long time, honestly, we took for granted here at DataStack that we have this really powerful search application built into Cassandra. Um, and that search application is called Solar, for those um, of you who are not from the Solar Vita. Um, solar, uh, I like to think of it as the, as the tortilla that wraps the wonderfulness that is Lucene. And Lucene is an indexing um, uh, system, which is all the rice and wheat and beans inside of the tortilla. So Solar and Lucene is still is a, is a single project now, and Solar is the nice wrapper to the wonderful Lucene indexes that are available. Uh, I did this, this talk in Europe for the first time a few weeks ago, and I realized, I'm like, I can't do burritos, can I? So what did we do? We did pray for Anyway, I think you guys can. Lucy <laughs> 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 seems a bit sweeter. <laughs> so how do Lucy? So Lucy is the underpinnings of pretty much every search application out there. Um, again, something you probably use all the time, and you really had no idea. <clears throat> Um, both uh, Lucene and Solar, though, are pretty much just a set of jars. They are not a database of themselves. Uh, Lucene indexes are actually file-based. Uh, there's not a built-in replication or distribution. They, it's, a, it's a pretty, they're, they're pretty solid for what they do. They look for stuff. So specifically, how a Lucene index works is it takes a document, and I've got a very short document here, that's the bright blue butterfly hangs in the breeze, and that gets tokenized into, in, in this case, into individual words. So those are tokens. <clears throat> those individual uh, terms are then given IDs, and then listed in what documents are available. For the most part, this is what Lucene Index is. There's some other stuff in it, and yet, yes, I am sure the solar Lucene people in here will be like, no, it's not quite right. Goodness. Right. This is in it called an inverted index, and this is and what is wonderful about these inverted indexes is they are super fast and they are super efficient. They you can find stuff incredibly quickly with these, um, but it can be lonely for solar. You know, as, as I mentioned, solar um, isn't a distributed architecture. It's not a doesn't live in the cloud. It doesn't have all the wonderful buzzwords as you've come to expect from, um, from systems nowadays. So luckily, we have something that can be friends with solar, and that's Cassandra. So Cassandra, <coughs> for those out there who are, don't use it, is a highly available, linear scalable uh, OLTP system. And I want to focus here on the fact that it's an OLTP system because it's just different than my experience coming into working with Cassandra. This is for low latency queries that are for a very short request to use a Kurt Von Ash term. Very short bits of information back and forth out of the system. But what is wonderful about Cassandra is that it's always on. It's highly available and it is, and it is scalable. And we have got customers with what we've heard about a 1500 node cluster recently at Boy. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We've got a 1500 node cluster. We've got customers with 75,000 nodes in production. I mean, this, this thing can scale. And thinking about Netflix, for example, again, that intrepid three year old who's had an iPad also had Netflix on that iPad because, again, mommy was a little busy with, a, with an infant. And if that, if that Netflix app went down, believe me, I would have heard about mm -hmm. it. And believe me, every single one about out you out there would have heard about it if Netflix has gone down. Mm -hmm. So Netflix has chosen Cassandra along with all of our other customers. Many of you have, uh, have chosen it because it is always on and always available. So when you put Cassandra and Solar together, what do you get? You get all the good things. You get all the wonderful search abilities of uh, solar um, and all of the characteristics of Cassandra. One thing that Cassandra is not particularly great at, as I mentioned earlier, is um, joins or aggregates. It's actually, and I was just, I was just talking to somebody earl, um, before this about this, is that Cassandra doesn't really do ad hoc queries very well. 
And I, I lost my ad hoppiness. Slide. No. I have a slide of ad hoppiness continuum. Sandra's not very ad hoc. -y. And for those out there who English is in your first language, don't worry, ad hoc -y is not a word. I made that up. Um, Cassandra is not very ad hoc. -y. You need to know your queries before you build your data model with Cassandra. If you don't do that, I will find you. And if you if you don't know how to do that, there's some lovely videos, Google Cadre with that and data modeling. I'll tell you all about it. You need to know your queries before you data model. Solar being search allows you to know allows you to do searches on certain fields. So you can do a little bit more ad hoc type of queries. You can say, okay, I want to know information on this particular field. And it will build up these inverted indexes for you ahead of time. So it's it's paying, it's you know. Paying a little bit of ad hociness, get a little bit more ad hociness, but you have to do a little bit more work up front. You have to create these, these indexes. On the last edge of the spectrum, which is not covered in tonight's talk, is Spark on top of Cassandra. Spark on top of Cassandra gives you full ad hoc ability, uh, but you do pay for it with speed. It's not as fast as Cassandra or even Zola on top of Cassandra. If you're interested in learning more about Spark and Cassandra, you come by and talk to me, uh, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I'm sure we've done other meetups. Yes, we've done Spark. Yes, probably not. A couple hundred times at this point. <laughs> All right, so what are the things that you get from Cassandra? That what, is, what does Solar get from Cassandra? Um, high availability, because you never know what's going to happen. There could be a, a zombie apocalypse. You, you're not sure what is going to happen in your system. So how does high availability work? In Cassandra. Now, this will be very brief because we don't have a lot of solar people in here, but I was prepared for that. Um, your application writes out data, um, it gets hashed into a token value. This token value is some value between 0 to, well, it's 128 bit number. It's fish. And um, each one of these particular nodes will um, have a certain range of tokens that's available to it. We can send in a set of replication factors. So you say, how many copies of the data do you want? In our case, the replication factor is three. And in your case, the replication should be three. It doesn't have to be. Uh, so three copies of this token, this 43, gets distributed around the room. That way, if we lose a node, we've got two others to, to, um, to fulfill the request. Um, why I like replication factor three is that this node goes down. We can fix whatever happened to this node on this one and still be able to maintain our always on state. Um, and then just three makes a very good number without too much replication. All right, so then, um, but what happens if we have an entire data center go down? Right? We didn't, uh, I think I just saw on, on, on the interweb couple of days ago about how the big earthquake is going to hit, wipe out everything west of I-5. Did everybody see that? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, there goes your data center, right? So luckily we have another one because, you know, those, 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 that Netflix app, my five-year-old really still needs to be able to watch Netflix, especially if there's a devastating earthquake. Um, so we have another data center out there. So the replication three goes here. One goes over to another data center, and then this data center will replicate whatever replication factor is here. <coughs> Pretty basic. Everybody get that? Yeah, that's great, Joel. So, uh, Cassandra and Solar together takes advantage of Cassandra's native abilities to replicate data to a different data center by defining a new data center as the Solar data center or the search data center. This data center doesn't have to be a physical, a new physical data center. It can live in the same rack, it's fine. But to Cassandra, you're giving it an entirely new data center, a new virtual data center. So when new rights come into Cassandra, it's going to automatically replicate it over to your solar nodes, your Cassandra and solar nodes. Does that make sense? Pretty cool, right? Because what, what, are we, what are we no longer doing here? I mentioned it earlier in my talk. ETL. Oh, did I hear that? Say that again? ETL. ETL, that's right. 
No more ETL. So if any of you guys out there are taking data out of your Cassandra system and maybe moving into something called a local or another type of system like that, you are you are creating a single point of failure. You're creating more work. You're creating more op op uh, operational complexity for yourself by having to move it out of a Cassandra system into a separate source system. This way, Cassandra will do it all natively for you. It'll keep the two data centers completely in sync. And again, they don't have to be physical data centers. They can be virtual. Any questions? That was a big one. All right. I'll believe you. You mentioned the other way, the lack of search for it. The question is, we look at solar versus a lot of business on the side of the other one versus the other. Is this the business decision that we're on? So why didn't we, um, why didn't we integrate it in Elasticsearch? Um, it was business decision early on. And I think, I think we made the right decision. Like I'm looking at the Elasticsearch and what we've done in solar, and we'll talk about some of the enhancements that we've done in solar. And I, and I like the fact that we're kind of working with more pure Products, but I did up our, our VP of engineering next time to see him and ask him that question. <laughs> it's all the What? It's all the same, exactly, at the end of the day, right? Was the solar more established at the time? That's what he said, yeah. Okay, so very basic how does this work um, in, on an individual node? Cassandra stores the data, solar stores the index. Pretty simple, right? Your data is still, is still um, stored in Cassandra just like it would on a Cassandra node, managed just like Cassandra node, but then you have your Lucene indexes that sit on top. Pretty straightforward. So when a query hits a solar node, it's going to go to Lucene indexes, it's going to find out which documents it's required, then it's going to go look those documents up. So the, you have two access mechanisms to access your data, your solar, and your solar Cassandra nodes, and your search nodes. I'm going to try to say your search nodes from now on. You can go through the solar API. This looks vaguely familiar to probably some of you. Uh, this will work just fine. You can uh, query to your heart's content, or you can do it directly in what we call CQL. Is anybody in here familiar or not familiar with CQL? Or Okay, great. So CQL is a Cassandra query language. It looks vaguely like SQL, yes? Yeah, that, that, this is how you access Cassandra. For those out there who are worried about accessing a NoSQL database, it's, it looks a lot like SQL. Uh, so this is CQL, and you actually just can embed your solar query directly into your CQL. So very, very simple access mechanism. Get to it directly from your applications with all of our all the different kernel drivers. Uh, again, this was in here for my solar heaps, um, but a Cassandra table is a, a solar core. A row is a document, a column is a field, and then as a table is an index. So those are the the way that those two vocabularies kind of match. Can you go back a slide? Nope. What was what was the second query? At the bottom. Oh, great. Good. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. <coughs> so this one is um, another solar query, right? Where we're just searching for ID star, right? We're looking for you know anything in the star. But we've actually uh, put in some specific CQL functions that allow us to narrow it down to a particular node. So we can token ID. It's just I just wanted to show an example of a complex solar query and then a very, sol a very simple solar query for the more complex CQL statement. Okay, so how, do, how does all of this work? So first off, let's talk about how we write data to Cassandra, the famous uh, Cassandra write app. So uh, first off, we've got a node that acts as a coordinator. This is getting information from the application. The application has a driver on it that decides which node is going to be the coordinator. Remember in Cassandra, every node is a peer, so every node can be a coordinator. So this is your, your, your coordinator node. It's going to write. Uh, the first place it's going to write to, actually it writes to two places. Um, it appends to a commit log. As soon as it hits the commit log, that means it's a good, durable write. 
Um, the second um, right is going to go to the mem table, which lives in memory. And that's it. This is, and so for those who are unfamiliar with Cassandra, this is why Cassandra's writes are so fast. All it has to do is, is uh, append to a sequential file that lives on disk and write to memory. Super fast. So it will acknowledge the write, and then periodically, the, uh, the data that's in memory will flush to disk to something called SS tables. These are stored string tables. After a while, uh, we're going to get a lot of sort of string tables, and this uh, will start to uh, make our, our data more um, fragmented on disk, and therefore start slowing down our reads. And we don't want anything that's slow in Cassandra. So what will happen periodically is a process called compaction. Is anybody here familiar with compaction? Who loves compaction? It's a favorite thing, right? Uh, compaction will come up, and it will merge the SS tables into one. Because when you write an SS table once, it's immutable. So compaction will actually go through and put them together. So that's the right path in Cassandra. Make sense? Everybody's very familiar with it? Yes? No? Okay. Oh, nods, yes. So a, it's a very similar structure for the way that writes are acknowledged in SOLAR. Again, we go to the coordinator. There's a piece of code called the shard router. And the shard router is, um, is part of the Instax Enterprise code. It will determine which shard or which node the, uh, this write needs to go to. What's the node? Um, it will work the same way as it does with any Cassandra. Okay, so the node is a collection of nodes. Yes, this is going to be a replication factor, right? So it'll be free. If it, if it doesn't, it'll hint. Same, same mechanism. So the first place it's going to write is the RAM buffer. And that RAM buffer is uh, periodically going to do something called a soft commit. And that soft commit level is um, how often it soft commits is, uh, is managed by you. Um, it will Plus the current state to the segments, which are uh, with the memory. And then eventually those uh, in memory segments will flush to disk. <coughs> um, the hard commits, when it flushes to disk, happens at the same time the mem table flushes happen. They're coordinated. Yep. Yeah, the soft commits are you say how often you want your soft commit threshold to be. By default, it's 10 <coughs> seconds, which is probably a good number. Um, until we talk about live indexing a little bit. What about forcing uh, compaction? Forcing compaction. That way you know when, like, you know, so let's say you've got the flushable condition, you want to make sure that you persist that indexing is really easy. Oh, so, so force the flush? Yeah, you can force the flush if you want. It's all, it, a hard commit is always coordinated with a memory flush. It's even there on my slides, so it must be true. It's like the internet. Um, like uh, compaction, merge comes through and will um, um, manage those segments. This is a soft world event, though. So, one of the reasons that we try to keep people from having too many segments is that, unlike compaction, which happens in the background, a merge stops your application from running. So. There, there is a trade-off in solar between having a lot of segments, which will speed up how fast you can ingest data, and then having to merge those segments together. Yeah. So this means that solar cloud is completely the same, right? Like no, this is not solar cloud at all. Okay, so There's nothing to do with solar cloud. Okay. Completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we we don't believe in um, it, we believe in transparent charting, so no solar cloud. Alright, so in general, um, with solar, the RAM buffer is not searchable, but the, everything in node memory and, the, and in the segments is searchable. So once the data leaves the RAM buffer in, in solar and goes into segments in, into memory or se and segments onto disk, it becomes searchable. So this is the, the trade-off that you're trying to do, is as you're ingesting data, because Cassandra is very, very fast data ingest, you need to um, manage how fast data is um, is ingested into solar because you want to be able to uh, you want to be able to be searchable. So you need to be you can control how quickly it becomes searchable. 
So other things that Cassandra gets, um, or Solar gets from Cassandra, is scalability. Pretty much just like uh, Cassandra scale, if you add a node, you get more capacity. Linear scalability, same thing goes with Solar. Pretty straightforward. And at the beginning, you get improved performance. So Cassandra is, is a highly performant system. We've actually uh, done some very specific enhancements to solar in order to improve the performance of, um, of, Cassandra, of DSC search or Cassandra on top of search. The latest is called Live Indexing. Live Indexing is actually a collection of various enhancements. But one of the most interesting is that it makes that RAM buffer searchable. So those who know solar know how big of a deal this is. Uh, those who don't, uh, it's, it's groundbreaking. It's, it's new and it allows your Cassandra system, your solar system to keep up with your Cassandra <coughs> ingest speed because Cassandra is just so much faster than solar being able to connect data. So making your RAM buffer searchable really, really helps that. It also makes it multi-threaded. Um, there's some batching. We've replaced HTTP with Netty. Uh, some push down predicates. There's a whole list of, um, of enhancements that we've done to solar and then also to <coughs> easy search to basically make, uh, make search more, um, be able to keep up with this on. So there, here's a benchmark that we, we did in, in house. This is standard uh, solar indexing, and Cassandra can uh, do it uh, safely. Oh, God, it was almost 50% uh, uh, faster. But this isn't a one-way street. It's not just Cassandra giving to Solar all the time. Solar does give something to Cassandra. We've, and we talked earlier about this ad hociness spectrum, right? Solar makes Cassandra searchable. It, may, it gives Cassandra the ability to do things that Cassandra can't do maybe. Um, so there is an app out there, uh, or a website called Killer Video. There's no R, K-I-L-L-R video.com. It's a website that we host. Um, one of the other evangelists had built it off a of .NET. It's, it's a, it, there's, a, uh, there's code on GitHub. It just gives you an example application. And uh, I went up to Luke uh, the other day and said, uh, hey, you have a search bar there. What can you search? He's like, oh, we've got a search on tags. You can search on people's tags. OK, that's interesting. Um, so behind the scenes, there's this video table. Again, this is CQL. This is the, the, the create table table for the videos um, table. And um, in Cassandra, in order to put an index to make to be able to search on some of these columns, you, you might be able to do location type. I think there's only two value, two possible values in there, so it's low cardinality. That's a pretty good secondary index possibility. But if you want to do something on name or on, you know, you want to do name, for example, that's not a very good idea. But don't you think you people want to search on video name? It's a yeah, a pretty standard to request. Um, so in order even for him to do the videos by tag, what he did is he created a new um, a new table as an index. And for those who have used Cassandra, this is typically how you maintain, um, how you allow for searching or for more um, complicated queries by creating your own indexes. Um, but wouldn't you like to maybe search on name or add a date or description. So the, luckily that's where Solar gives you the easy button. So the integration of Cassandra or the Solar on top of Cassandra, these are the five steps. So first off you spin up a new uh, Cassandra cluster with search enable. And to do that you use this command. So if you go down to uh, you download the DSC uh, uh, DSX Enterprise from our website, it's free to download. Spin up a, uh, a new node back in the uh, You run your schema DDL. If you if this is a new cluster, if you are adding to an existing cluster, it will just automatically propagate for you. Then you run something called DSE tools on the videos table. So this DSE tool create core on that table videos generate resources true. What that's going to do is create a Lucene index <coughs> on top of every single column in that table. So that will make that one command right there will allow every single column in your Cassandra table to be searchable. Mm, yes, I see some people going, oh, okay, this looks pretty good. Yeah. 
Now, this is the cost of space, just the size of your listed indexes, which is the, I can't, they're all going to be different sizes. Um, I would say that if you do want the nodes that you can search on to have more memory, if you want those listed indexes to more memory. So you want different machines usually. So now you use a solar admin to make sure you have a core, and then you can write a SQL query. So now select star from killer videos, where we have a solar query here, and then there's an EDIS max query that searches on names, tags, and description, and it's looking for a tool called data. So how did I get those five easy steps? Well, the guy who wrote the uh, killer video, I asked him to do this, and this is what he told me. So this is actually my hit chat conversation with him. After I said, hey, Luke, how did it go? And he said, oh, well, this is how it went. And he said it was, it was dead dumb simple. Right? He said this was probably the easiest thing he did had to do, and probably the most complicated thing was do, learning the EDIS max syntax. So those five steps are not from documentation, they're not from marketing, they're from Luke doing it. We never, we never touched it before. So those are the resources out there. Um, if you want to down, so you want to look at killer video, if you want to download the code behind it all. It's freely available. I think I'm right. Oh, look at that right on time. Yeah. So when you do 